uh, like, I don't know enough about energy to have a strong, you know, I have strong opinions loosely held, but my sense is we're looking at a lot of technologies like wind and um, solar that are nowhere near as bountiful as nuclear. Mm-hmm. And that the the thing that we're offsetting because we're afraid of nuclear power is that we're literally taking the most valuable asset that we have in the United States, which is farmland, and we're putting giant metal robots uh, on it that are only getting you know a fraction of the energy that you could get out of nuclear. How does that sit with the the chemical engineer in you? Yeah, I I so uh, you know as part of engineering, you always get into safety, right? Part of our and, and nuclear is is scary in that regard, right? There are a lot of issues around the waste that's generated, the fuel that goes in, um, the potential for a, an accident. So I personally think nuclear is a valuable part of the energy uh, spectrum. You know, we we it's a good, it's low carbon. There's no doubt about it, but it is limited in the sense that locations for plants and how you deal with the waste, um, in particular the waste, is is kind of limited. So I wouldn't I wouldn't want to wholesale switch to a whole lot more nuclear, but I do think that the nuclear we have already built, we've already paid for, you know, already has all this stuff at, in place should be continued. So I'm, I'm a fan of keeping the nuclear we have. I don't, I, I'd have to think more about it uh, to give you an opinion on adding a lot more, but I also think that wind and solar wind is a little dicey, right? I mean, we're in Iowa and we get a lot, I think it's, we're up to like 40% of our electricity in Iowa is now from wind. Um, because we're a good state for wind, a lot of wind, a lot of exposed places for turbines. So I think wind can really work well in the right places. So I'm a fan of wind in that regard. But once again, you don't want to just start sticking turbines everywhere because your point about displacing farmland is good. Also, they need to be efficient to justify the, their location. Solar is another one, though. Solar is one of these that's kind of become more and more efficient over the years. I mean, a, a, the amount of energy, electricity you can get from a panel, a square foot is has gone up by 10 times oh and, it shocked me i was getting yeah. some survival stuff with like little panels that you just set outside yeah and i was stunned on a on a direct but winter day where you don't have that much sunlight you can power uh, uh, you could at least charge a laptop with the, one of those things that you set outside so that is pulling down some serious wattage so i think i think solar is one of those examples as i mentioned i think just this year they crossed over if you had to build a new power facility from the ground up solar would be the cheapest per kilowatt now that depends on where you are you know versus the equator and everything you couldn't do that in alaska but in the us especially the lower two thirds so so i so i i guess what i'm getting at is i i actually do believe solar and wind should be exploited as much as reasonable your point is good you don't want to take productive too much productive cropland out of business but if the farmer gets paid a reasonable fee for the land and still farming efficiencies get us more crops per acre i i think we can kind of manage that one solar is a great option the problem with nuclear nuclear is good because it runs all the time and by that i mean your nuclear reactor can run 24 7 the problem with solar and wind is not that they're not great sources it's just that they are good for what i'd call the base load and solar of course doesn't shine overnight so you need something else to make up what we what I would call peak demand, meaning those transient demands. You know, everyone comes home from work, turns on their air conditioner all at once. Um, it, all of a sudden, the demand goes way up. You know, you can't turn up the sun, you can't turn up the wind. So, what we really need is as much base load from our renewable sources, and then figuring out what's the smartest way to add that incremental load, either when the renewable sources are lower output than expected, or we just have a peak demand. So, nuclear's turns up pretty well. Historically, the best way to turn up the, the current is coal or, or natural gas because you just crank up that power generating station. So most of the peak power generating stations that are being built in the last five years have been natural gas. It's cleaner burning than coal. We have a lot of it. It's cheap. Um, so getting that peak demand is the big question for me. Um, and you know, biofuels can be burned to make electricity too. So there, there is a, a someday a potential opportunity for renewable fuel to be used to run turbines and, and make electricity. Right now, it's just more expensive than natural gas. Natural gas is so cheap in the US that it's hard to hard to get anybody to consider anything else. In the beginning of the, you know, the podcast, we were talking about how um, demand will increase. And when I think about um, demand, I think of a place like Kenya, 
where at least when I was living there about 15 years ago, most houses did not have electricity. If you were outside of the city, you didn't have electricity running to your house and you're still using charcoal stoves inside of your home to cook your food or to heat your water, to heat your bath water, right? They don't, they don't have any of these as uh, possibilities like um, that they can just turn on an appliance. So as you think about bringing up and matching the demand that is all over the earth, um, how do you think that plays out over the next 10 to 15 years? Yeah, that's another great question. You know, I think one of the nice things about a lot of the third world is they do have typically a lot of sunlight. You know, they're not living in Antarctica or northern Canada. It's it's equatorial type stuff. So I think we mentioned solar as a great way to bring electricity, at least at device scale, you know, phone, laptop, lights, um, to to those areas. But the other one is is how do you handle applications where electricity isn't necessarily the best answer. And so I feel like, you know, this is my bias, but this is why I work for the company I do is, you know, biofuels actually offer that that fill in the gap option for liquid fuels. Because one of the things I was thinking about the other day when I was, I was talking to people at my company is, you know, when you look back at developments over the centuries, you could make an argument that liquid fuels change the world as much as anything. You know, it's easy to say, oh, electricity changed the world or this, but Liquid fuels contain an amazing amount of energy in a very small, portable, transportable com- package. And the only the, it only takes you realizing that people used to build ships and go out into the coldest North Atlantic water, get on little tiny rowboats, and harpoon the largest mammal you know on, on right. Earth, drag them on board in order to rip them open and have that sweet sweet whale oil. To turn yeah. into to lamp, to run their light, lamp, right? yeah, exactly. And yeah. so you, you think about that, then then you start realizing like, oh wait, once we got gasoline, that's a total game changer. And I feel like that's what, as a society, we we overlook. The most common people have no sense of how energy dense and amazing and revolutionary liquid fuels are because they allow that truck to drive across the country or the railroad to drive across the country without having to stop every 50 miles and put more wood or coal or water on, uh, you know, air, you couldn't have air travel. There would be no aircraft without liquid fuels ever. There would never yeah, it'd be, be hard to keep them up in a chart. I mean, you'd uh, have the dirigibles, <laughs> right? You'd have, you'd have the Zeppelin or whatever, but, uh, but in, so, so when you think about that, that, that's just sort of that sense of wonder, wow, what did liquid fuels do? But it also means they do things that are almost impossible to replace. So electricity can replace a passenger vehicle pretty easily because think about the way we drive. I need to drive back and forth to work, to the store, and then I can put it in my garage and charge it overnight. I don't have to run it 24-7. And I don't really use that much. It's not energy dense. I'm not, I'm not having to haul you know, 40,000 pounds of something 400 miles yeah my the so, roads have like no further of a grade than you know 30 percent or whatever on the on the steepest hill you can get to right so i think liquid i think finding you know renewable electricity which solar is a great example for the third world but also having more sustainable or you know cleaner for the environment liquid fuels is part of the key and then thinking about what is a good choice to replace with electricity and what is a bad choice to replace with electricity a good example is you know, a heavy duty engine needs all that power. If you had a battery electric, you would, you know, you spend roughly two to three times as much time charging it as running it. So you'd, you'd have to have multiple vehicles or you'd have to have multiple battery sets. And these batteries are big and heavy, much heavier. You know, it's about 15 times heavier per unit energy than liquid fuels. So uh, it, it's just, it, it doesn't make sense to do electricity everything. And I think a lot of our policymakers get, hung up on, I need a one size fits all solution. And they think it's electricity. So I think electricity will cover a lot of those things should cover a lot of things that are good for electricity. That makes sense, but heavy duty work, long haul trucking, rail ships, uh, aircraft, you know, that's going to have to be, if we're going to go to a lower or eventually zero petroleum world, that's going to have to be liquid renewable fuels. And those work well in the third world as well, because you can transport them easily. Um, you can store them safely, but, you know, biodiesel, one of the things I love about it, it's, it's essentially like vegetable oil from a safety standpoint there. It's not flammable. It doesn't have any odor to speak of. You can store it in your wherever, and it's not a hazard. If you have to clean it up, you can clean it up yourself. You don't have to call in, you know, the hazmat suit folks. So 
I think it's a great option for the third world. Um, and that electricity hopefully can be more and more distributed. You can have these solar stations that don't need to be connected to a nationwide grid anymore. And you know that's one of the beauties of distributed electricity generation. Thanks for checking out this podcast short. If you like this interview, make sure you hit the like and subscribe button and hit that bell so you always get notified about this podcast. And if you're really interested in conversations like this, you may want to consider joining the Articulate Ventures Network. To find out more, go to network.articulate.ventures.